Healthcare is too expensive. Employers are offsetting costs onto their employees. Who will make health benefits affordable for hardworking Americans and their families? You will. This is the Empowering Plans Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you once again emphasize the benefit in Benefit Plan. Now prepare to learn, plan, save, and protect with the FIA Group. Hey, how you doing, everybody? It's the FIA Group and another Empowering Plans podcast for your listening pleasure. And while I'm over-pronouncing those P's, let me take a moment and say hello to our incredible, unrivaled podcast producer, the man, the myth, the legend, the triple P, Pat, the podcast producer. How you doing, Pat? Alliteration always warms the soul. It sure does. You know, I honestly think that's why they limited the number of letters in the alphabet, because if there were too many, we'd encounter too many situations where words don't all start with the same one. Boggles the mind. (laughs) Yeah, and that's my job. I'm here to boggle your mind. You know, before you uh, go and complain to HR about my boggling of your mind, let's talk about the ultimate boggler, speaking of alliteration, the Brady Boggler. Brady, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> That's a great name. I like that. All I'm right. doing great, Ron. I'm, I'm ready to boggle some minds. You feeling strong? I'm feeling great, yeah. All right, you're well-rested? Well-rested, ready to go. All right, because, you know, you've had one full night of sleep following the most recent Democratic debate. So you took yesterday off, you stayed home, you drank some tea, you splashed some water on your face, you got over what you saw on television, now you're here to tell us what you think? I am, yeah. It's been quite the, uh, I think we're at the 12th debate now. It's, it feels like it's been just so many debates. But this debate in particular, I'm excited about because it's the first debate where we talked about healthcare, but we didn't really talk about Medicare for all. Because I feel like we've talked about Medicare for all really as much as you can at this point. It's unclear what version we're talking about whenever it comes up. The same talking points are used. But this time, we talked about drug pricing. In the Ooh, you know, when, I was, uh, when I was a younger man, I remember that I was told to just say no to drugs. You guys remember that? Yeah, just say no to drugs. And it's interesting because if I remember correctly, the war on drugs related to uh, illegal recreational drugs. But today, the war on drugs seems to be a battle with the legal pharmaceutical industry, Brady. And uh, they came out with guns blazing, didn't they? They did. I think it's more precisely a war on drug prices. That's ah, there you go. Raging. Hey, I've got things to say about that. We'll talk in a minute. But, yeah, uh, well, we've been talking about for, I feel like, months now, the various proposals that were have come out of the executive branch, the legislative branch. Everyone agrees that the price of drugs is just way too high. We've heard these horror stories about people not taking their medications. Moderators even cited to a poll from Kaiser saying that last year, 29% of people didn't take a prescription that was filled for them by their doctor because they couldn't afford it which is obviously a huge problem. So the question was asked, what would you do to the candidates to combat rising drug prices? And I think it was a good thing that at the outset, at least all the candidates agreed to one of the most popular proposals that even the administration agrees with, which is to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices. I think everyone agrees that's like an easy thing to do. The problem with that is there's a bill currently sitting in the Senate that would allow for that, that we don't think is going to get any action anytime soon, partly because of the whole impeachment mess that's taken over everything, but also because there are still quite a few Republicans that don't want to see Medicare negotiate directly with manufacturers. I'm not sure exactly why. You could have a cynical reason and say, well, you know, a lobbyist got to them. But for whatever reason, the bill that passed the House that would allow for negotiation has stalled. But I think this is going to be a refrain we keep hearing this year because, and it's bipartisan, at least as long as Trump's in the White House, his administration is also in favor of this. So I think there's going to be pressure building on the Senate leader to allow a vote on this bill eventually. I think we'll get there probably after this impeachment fiasco is over more toward the spring. But that was one of the first things that came up. Another thing that came up is sort of more individualized plans that the different candidates had for how they would lower drug prices. I know, Ron, you posted an observation you made on LinkedIn about why when the candidates talk about the cost of drugs, you know, they go right to the actual source, the cost of the actual manufactured drug and how you wish 
that they would do the same with healthcare services. Yeah, you know, it is interesting. So a couple surprises from the debate for me, right? Number one, when they talk about the issue of people not taking their medication, they immediately assume it's because they can't afford it. I think the solution to that problem is quite simple, really. You just produce every medication in gummy form. Because I don't know about you, once I started taking the gummy multivitamins, I couldn't help but take them regularly. In fact, I think I sometimes overdose, you know? <laughs> Same thing for my kid. But joking aside, yeah, the issue of pricing, it, it is fascinating because in, in my mind, and I don't think this really has to do with the fact that we're in the industry, Brady, I think it's just almost commonsensical when you think about it. Healthcare is healthcare is healthcare, right? So if I am taking some sort of medication or drug that's meant to maintain or improve my health, it's healthcare. If I go to visit a physician or a specialist whose job it is, is to maintain or improve my health, it's healthcare. If I go to a facility to undergo treatment using some sort of medical device or procedure to maintain or improve my health, guess what it is, guys? It's healthcare. So in my mind, anything that you are consuming as a patient to maintain or improve your health is healthcare, and it falls under this umbrella of healthcare. And as people who represent these health benefit plans, and we're looking at the claims that they're paying for healthcare, you can go through those claims and you're going to see this is for a medication, this is for a procedure, this is for a physician, this is for a facility, and they all fall under this umbrella of covered services. What I think is fascinating, Brady, and you just brought it up and it is on LinkedIn, is the fact that when politicians are talking about the cost of drugs, they're talking about the price tag that is attached to that drug. But when they talk about the price of healthcare, they're not talking about the price tag that's attached to fill in the blank, that surgery, that overnight stay at a hospital, that examination by a physician, which I think is fascinating, particularly because, and as somebody whose family just went through the process of battling cancer and beating cancer, at least half, I'll say, of that experience, which we would all agree is a very costly healthcare experience, is medication, is drugs, chemotherapy. But because my wife was receiving chemotherapy in a hospital setting, a politician would call that healthcare and immediately attack the benefit plan, the health insurance. And when you talk about the cost of treating cancer, you would focus on my premiums, my deductibles, my co-pays, my out-of-pockets. But let's say chemotherapy was something instead, the, the drug, the chemicals themselves, was something that you as a consumer purchased at a pharmacy instead of had received at an inpatient setting. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to talk about the cost of the actual chemotherapy drugs themselves because now it's about the price of drugs, which I think is fascinating because ultimately, isn't it all the same? What is the price of that health care in whatever form it takes? It is all the same. I think I thought about this, Ron, briefly between the time before we had this podcast, and all I'd come up with in terms of the answer is politics. That, Absolutely. Right? Of course, it's much more popular to attack the drug manufacturers who seem to be faceless and the big bad companies, you know, insurance companies are, would be in that group too. But when you're going to shed light on or put the spotlight on providers and what they're charging, you know, that's doctors. That They're much more popular. People like their doctor. You know what disappoints me, Brady? I guess every day I become more and more cynical is the fact that you're right. Absolutely. When you think of insurance, right? When you think of insurance, and I'm not pointing fingers at any specific candidates, but there are a few who like to paint with broad brushes, particularly when it comes to the insurance companies and corporations. Again, not pointing any fingers. They paint out or they, the, the image that they create from an insurance carrier or corporation is somebody in a suit whose only concern is making money you know, for themselves and their shareholders and denying claims and being ruthless and making this profit on the backs of the working class. And what's fascinating to me is I know that in the insurance setting, right, you've got people of every sort. You do have people like that, but then you also have people who are in and of themselves working class, right? There are working class blue collar people who come in and process claims and work for that big bad insurance company that you're literally talking to them and bad mouthing their employer. Likewise, pharmaceutical or drug companies, 
if you go on LinkedIn or you can see my resume, I don't think it's any secret, I actually spent some time with the legal department at a pharmaceutical company. And I can tell you, same thing. There are some people who are involved in the business, and their job is to make profit. And whether you think profit is evil or not, they would tell you that unless you're making a profit, you can't continue operating. And if you can't continue to operate and keep the doors open, you can't continue to pursue your mission, which in this case is to create life-saving drugs, which I think we would all agree is not a bad thing. So there are those people who are looking after the bottom line. At the same time, you have people who are scientists and researchers who have gone through years and years of school, who are now night and day working, giving up their own personal lives, pursuing some sort of cure for XYZ disease. And it's incredible when you read about these people who have diseases that are very rare. And no medication, no drug, no treatment exists for that condition because of its rarity. And yet you hear about how this pharmaceutical company or that pharmaceutical company has set aside some of its researchers to try and find a cure for this one little girl or this handful of patients. I'm sorry. I understand that it's a for-profit business and it's easy to point the finger and demonize pharmaceutical companies. And I know they've made their share of mistakes, but I refuse to paint with that broad brush and say they are evil or they should be a target of our angst. At the same time, hospitals, providers of healthcare, you talk about targeting doctors. I agree. Go ahead, turn on regular you know, television, network television, cable television. The hero of almost every other drama show is a doctor, you know, like Grey's Anatomy, right? Follow the, the exploits of these wonderful people. The doctors are always the heroes. But hospitals are businesses just like pharmaceutical companies, just like insurance carriers. They have people wearing suits. They have people whose job it is is to create profit. So honestly, I don't know how you can target one and not the other. We're all doing the same thing. We're all making the same mistakes. And I think we can all have room to improve. But it's not right or it seems disingenuous to target the cost of the care itself when you're talking about drugs, but target the cost of insurance or the means by which you pay for care when you talk about other health care. And I think it will come back to bite us because ultimately, whatever solution they implement for the cost of drugs, my hope is if it's rational and works, you can take it and apply it to other costs of health care as well. So maybe I should look at the silver lining and try to see the positive in it. But that's my spin. Yeah, I agree with most of that. I think it comes down to politics, right? And that's why when they cherry pick the examples of drugs that are, you know, in their view, and I think most people's view, to be, to be honest, extremely high cost, they're looking at things like insulin. They're talking about drugs that have been on the market for decades in some cases, which were, you know, invented 100 years ago. And there seems to be no rational explanation for the spike. But overall, I think, yeah, if, if they held providers to the same standard of their holding manufacturers, I think we'd be better for it. But I don't want to end this podcast without talking just for a second about some of the proposals that some individual candidates have, because I think that we'll see these again throughout the year. And so it's actually interesting because when they're looking for ways, they mean the government, of applying pressure to these manufacturers, they're looking for leverage. What they seem to be focusing on is patent rights and sort of intellectual property. And the idea that a lot of these candidates have is if manufacturers, in the government's opinion, are raise prices unfairly or refuse to negotiate in good faith, what some of these candidates are saying they'll do is basically strip them of their patent rights or introduce what's called marching rights or compulsory licensing, which allows the government to pretty much ignore an exclusive right that a manufacturer has to you know, patent its product and allows other competitors into the market. Or for Senator Warren, she actually introduced the idea of having the government itself manufacture generic drugs, which I think the, one of the moderators followed up with a question about why would Americans trust that given that you know trust in government is so low? I think it was a good question, which I don't think she fully answered. But all these solutions that they are coming up with, my takeaway from them is, and I've made this argument in other contexts and we've discussed it and previous webinars is that because Congress hasn't gotten its act together to pass some solution, what you see is executive branch officials or candidates who are running for president all giving you ideas of what they would do without Congress. So what we're seeing is an expansion of executive authority, which I think could be dangerous for the industry and probably even for government as a whole, because really it's how expansive is the power of the pen here, right? You're going to have a president come in on day one who's going to cancel student loan debt, you know, lower drug prices. It's like, why do we even have a Congress? So I've been saying this for a long time that I hope Congress, you know, sort of 
gets its act together and actually takes some kind of action, even if it isn't the perfect action, some action, because if they don't, what I worry about is we'll have a partisan person assume the White House or perhaps one who's already there, just use the power of the pen and just issue executive orders that have drastic sweeping impacts on, you know, an industry that's one sixth of our economy and there'll be very little we could do about it. So that's what I worry about. Yeah, you know, and I think that's fair. It's actually funny you mentioned about the uh, government-produced drugs. And again, right or wrong, I think that drug manufacturers may say that wrapped up into the price is the cost of sort of legal insurance for themselves, right? So like malpractice insurance, liability, so things where if something should happen, because again, when you're providing medication drugs to people, I think there's a heightened risk of some sort of reaction, damage, whatever. So when you're talking about somebody's health, right? And they're taking your medication, your drug, in many instances, an uncontrolled environment where they're self-dosing, right? And something goes wrong, right or wrong, they're going to come after you, right? So there's a lot of protection you need to layer on when you're producing these drugs. And all you have to do is watch one pharmaceutical commercial and when they list out all the potential negative reactions, right? But what's interesting is what happens when somebody takes a dose of government-produced insulin, and there was a problem on the manufacturing line, and somebody, they take the drug, and it doesn't work the way it's supposed to, and it causes some sort of injury or even death. You know, isn't there sovereign immunity? Yeah, there's I mean, sure I'm, government immunity. I'm just, yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering what would happen there. So again, oh I'm just, I, hey, listen, man, you know, don't bring a couple lawyers onto a podcast and ask them to assess. Hey, what happens if we just let the government do everything? <laughs> um, you know, there's a reason why sometimes it's good to have private industry involved because there are remedies as consumers against private industry that maybe don't exist against the government. But anyway, mm-hmm. we're not going to go there. Um, oh, we already did. Okay, gotcha, yeah. Pat. Um, but I think as a whole, you're right, Brady, and it is also fascinating. Love it or hate it, uh, our current president has shown a uh, very loose wrist when it comes to signing executive orders and, and taking sort of control and, and, and power into his own hands, sort of bypassing Congress whenever he can. And it's interesting to see these candidates knocking him for that behavior and then saying they're going to do the exact same thing. So it's not about taking advantage of executive power. It's about taking advantage of executive power to do things I don't agree with. Right. You know, that's really what it's about. Sounds like politics again. It sure does. (laughs) Just can't get away from it. Speaking of getting away from politics, Brady, let's step away for a second. You know, a lot of the candidates on the stage were trying to sort of climb up onto President Barack Obama's shoulders to either say what he did is great, but it's dated and we need to do something new, or what he did is great, let's just build on top of it. But everybody wants to at least kind of hitch their wagon to his horse, right? What is going on with the ACA? Yeah, it's funny you mention that because at this point, you know, it even looks like the president now wants to hitch his wagon in part to what President Obama did. Because, look, we've covered this a lot before in webinars, and anyone paying attention in the industry knows that there are parts of the ACA that are very popular still today, right? People like the protections for people with pre-existing conditions. People generally like the fact they can keep their children on their health plan until age 26. Generally, it's majority of people like it overall. And, you know, many people that have employer insurance like that insurance too. So we're in this weird predicament now where we had this case that we covered extensively, brought in Texas by Republican-led state's attorneys general against the ACA. And they brought this case, remember, After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed at the end of 2017, which basically zeroed out the individual mandates penalty, as a result of the mandate being pretty much defanged, the argument was that it's unconstitutional to have it as part of the ACA. And that, but yet it's such an integral part to the ACA, this mandate was, that if it goes, the whole thing has to go. So this federal court in Texas, this Judge Reed O'Connor, who's involved in a lot of conservative opinions out of that federal court, struck down both the individual mandate and the entire ACA. He found that you couldn't sever one from the other. He then stayed his own ruling pending appeal. We've waited the whole year, this whole past year, for the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans to take up the case, to hear the case. They had oral arguments in June. And what happened last month is they released their opinion, their decision. They agreed with the lower court that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. However, they refused to decide which parts of the ACA or if the entire ACA should thus go away. What they did instead is they kicked the case back down for further consideration. They basically punted it back to the lower court. So kind of like a a fake out and pretty frustrating to people following the case because I think they expect a little bit more clarity. So where we're at now is 
the Democrats who have defended the ACA in court, including those in the House of Representatives, are petitioning the Supreme Court. They want the Supreme Court to fast track this case and to take it up now and make a decision. And oddly, now the Republicans don't want a decision on this. So the Republicans who campaigned on, you know, repeal and replace, we heard that a million times, suddenly don't want the Supreme Court to take up this case. Now, why is that? Well, I think the answer, sadly, again, is politics, because they're in really a lose-lose situation. If the Supreme Court takes up the ACA case and upholds the ACA, again, which most people like, many parts of it, then the Democrats can say, we won, we defended your pre-existing condition protections. We defended the parts of the ACA you like. You know, go for us. And in the 2018 midterms where they flipped the House back blue, they ran on health care. So that would be bad, that kind of outcome for Republicans. If, on the other hand, the Supreme Court takes up the case and strikes down the law, which many people think might actually happen this time, Democrats can then say, look, Republicans took away your health care for 20 million people who would lose care. So Republicans don't want that either. And now that we've turned the corner into 2020 and the election's right around the corner, everything gets frozen in place. And unfortunately, you know, as lawyers, I think you and I both feel this way, that that really shouldn't be how cases are heard or how, you know, justice is decided. But I fear that that might be what's going on here. It would just take four justices to grant the petition for certiorari, as it's called, to hear the case in the Supreme Court. That may happen, but I don't know. I feel like if the administration is now asking, hey, you know, delay your decision, Supreme Court, and typically the Supreme Court doesn't get involved in these kinds of cases until they're fully resolved at the lower level. But given how important this case is, the pressure's on. So if politics wins the day, which for once, me speaking, hopes it doesn't. The Supreme Court will take this case and resolve it this year. But if not, we might have to talk again next year about how this plays out. And, you know, in addition to saying, hey, look, the Republicans took your coverage away, I think we'd also potentially create a void where people like Vice President Biden, who are arguing on the stance of let's just build upon or improve upon the ACA, well, that foundation is now gone. And so it creates a vacuum where all of a sudden people who are saying, hey, you know, I believe in Medicare for all, but I don't want to replace the ACA. Now you don't have to replace the ACA because <laughs> it's gone. Right. You know, so yeah, I, I agree. It is so fascinating to see how the pieces work together. It is. We're going to keep watching and we'll keep updating you and pretty much making it so that you don't actually have to watch the debates because, you know, we'll just tell you everything you need to know. On behalf of myself, Ron Peck, Executive Vice President and General Counsel of the FIA Group, Brady, the mind boggler Bizarro, Pat, the man, the myth, the legend, podcast producer Pat, and everybody at the FIA Group, thank you for joining us for another episode of Empowering Your Plans with the FIA Group. Thanks so much. Hey, Brady, I think you just called me a liar on national television. <laughs> I won't shake your hand.